be of all the Monica Lewinsky stories were going around, you know, the, the, the radio station I work at, a uh, community station in uh, KVMR in Nevada City, everybody come in, streams, everybody that works there comes in, they tell more Monica Lewinsky, Bill Clinton stories, you see. And I was telling them, you know, I was telling them, and finally I said, forgetting my own advice. And finally I, know, I saw that women were responding quite differently than men were. And so I started asking the women around me, you know, like Erica down there at the desk. And she said, most women have had the experience somewhat like this. See, so it's not funny to us. So, boom, I stopped telling them. Right? Stopped telling them. They recognize there's a victim here. And uh, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna put up with it. And then now when people try to tell me those, I shut it off. Um, okay, now to to take you've take got the comic value together, you've tried you've you've timed everything so you know what, what how how your lines work, you know, with bottles or belly laughs or what have you. Now you can do the hard work of putting it into a context context, contextualizing. <laughs> okay, for one thing. If I hear a story and it happened in um, it happened in uh, Somebody told me the story is supposed to be in Los Angeles, or it happened in San Francisco. Right? I'm going to localize that to the people where I am. I'm going to find place names, hooks I can hang things on, so that I can localize that story to my own life. I might use the names of people that I know, I might use the names of the street I used to live on, or the street that I do live on, the town that I live in. I'm going to take that comic value and I'm going to localize it put it in a whole a context that I own, a context in which I live. That makes it real. So that when you're doing a conversational sabotage, they say, hey, this must be real. <laughs> We're fools. <laughs> and, I'm, and then I'm going to ornament it. You know, I'm going to do little digressions. I'm going to wander off of blind alleys to throw them off my scent. All right? And, uh, and so a digression, localization. I'm really going to want to know who I'm with and where I am if I'm performing. See? Uh, doing stories like in, in uh, say, Worcester, Massachusetts, as soon as, I've, as soon as I've booked that engagement, I asked a person producing the show, this would be maybe three, four months ahead, to send me the local newspaper. So I can lead, read the want ads, I can read the articles, I can get local events, local politics, and again, place names, hooks to hang things on. So people really understand that I know who I'm with and I know where I am. I'm not, st not just doing the show that, that from the town before, the town before, the town before, you know. Real, really important. Um, another really important thing about stories, about this kind of storytelling, it, if, I, if I take that little nugget of value from some dumb bar joke, and I start working on it, and I start embellishing it with these guffaws and these baffos, and I start localizing it, I put all, it'll take me a year to finally get it to where I want it to be, to where I would feel comfortable sitting on a stage and, and telling it, a set piece, you see. What was it like to show up in Kansas City to play the fool killer and find out that the singer before you has sat on the stage and told the story you just put a year in, word for word, see? <laughs> and the producer is saying, better not tell that story because it just got told last week. Well, that's that's not good. That's not good. You don't steal. You don't steal whole cloth. You don't steal tail whole cloth. But again, you take whatever it was that made it funny, and you you own it. You take it over. You know, you take a logging story, make it into a mining story, make it into a beef story. You understand what I mean? But you never lift anything like right off of the record. Um, oh, this stuff this is just. Uh, don't ca never oh, don't walk on your own lines. You know, don't give, breathe, take your take your time. If you want people to laugh, you got to give them time to do that. You know, if you want to give people to think, you want something to really sink in. Stop, pause, let it happen. See, go slow. It's called otherwise you're walking on your own lines, and uh, and people aren't getting anything that uh, that you're trying to put out there. Uh, don't cap. It's really important. Don't cap. First of all, you, you go through a lot of stuff too fast. Um, capping means uh, somebody has just finished a story, like you're sitting around in a bar and you're telling jokes, just finished a story, and you jump right in on top of it. Well, here's one that you, you know. No, you wait. You just wait. And um, wait. Wait all night if you have to uh, for your opportunity to dodge in there and, uh, and do it. It's what happened with Art Thiem and the Egg Setting Horse. 
When we had exhausted ourselves one night storytelling at Holstein's bar, and we were ready to go home, and it was snowing, and we were all drunk and stupid, and in our theme, one of the best storytellers ever heard, we were getting up to put on our coats. He said, "What about the egg-setting horse?" Uh, see, and he waited. He didn't. He hadn't been in that session at all until right at the end, and he devastated us. Um, most unique example of that, I was playing in Sitka, Alaska. And it was the last concert of the series for the uh, community radio station. And uh, afterward, well, I mentioned to the audience on the stage, I said, I've been in Alaska for six weeks now, playing Skagway and playing Juno and Haynes and, and uh, all of those Sitka. I have not, I have yet to hear it's, uh, it's so cold that story. And I've, I was looking forward to hearing it was so cold that one after the other, I haven't heard one of them. I expressed my disappointment, disillusionment to them. We went over to the bar afterward. The cab driver drove me over. Interesting thought, quiet fellow, the cab driver. We all sat down. We started yarning. And some people came from the concert to give me those It's So Cold That stories to take back home with me as my only souvenirs. We started yarning back and forth. Just went, And we went on for about three or four hours, you know. And we were drinking a little and on three or four hours. And it was great. And we got to where everybody was done. We were played out. We had all taken our best shot three or four times. We were done for. <laughs> so we decided to pack it in. Getting up, getting to leave, the cab driver says, pipes up. So it's like, it, almost like he just awakened. And he said, why do Italian stonemasons wear square paper hats? <laughs> and we all turn and says, why? You know, he sees him and says, why? He said, well, you know, I, I grew up seeing that. I always wondered why. You're a pretty intelligent bunch. I just thought you might know. Nailed it, man. Nailed it. Go out. Don't do that. Nailed it. Well, well, look, uh, so, and then there's other things like, like telling stories. It's, I like to work in front of a mirror so that you don't throw your gestures away. You understand that you just just have a meaning. It's too easy. I've seen storytellers go like this, or, you know, it's meaningless gestures. I, I like to work in front of a mirror so I can make sure that my gestures sort of match the sense of what it is that I'm trying to get at. Um, that's really about all I know. Is that enough for you? <laughs> Uh, picked up by a, a fellow named Dakota Sid Clifford, a car thief by the name of Dakota Sid Clifford. I figured if you want to get where you're going fast, you might as well get picked up by a car thief. He had scored some little red unit, a Ferraru, I think he called it, and a uh, beautiful candy apple red, and oh, we did some shimmy oscillations up the pipe. It was phenomenal, you know. Uh, uh, it was, a, it was a, amazing. We pulled into a, a little gas station to, to get some gas, and the oldest artifact I'm ever likely to see in advanced stages of crusty old fart hood came out of the gas station there and, and uh, stuck his head right in the window and said, hot damn young fella, some fine car you got here must have 14 forward speeds and 14 cylinders on it. Well, it's got four and four, Dakota said, Clifford said, fill it full of the high test. I am in a desperate hurry. Well, the fellow started to pump gas, started doing chin music at us, you know how they do. Finally, he said, young fella, uh, out, out back of this gas station, I've got a 1934 Plymouth Roadster. It is the fastest car hereabouts. You wouldn't be interested in a little turn up the pipe, little contest, would you? Eh? <laughs> well, Dakota said, Clifford said, as I told you, I'm in a desperate hurry. I'm about to stand on this thing, but you're welcome to try to catch us if you mind to, and we roared out of there. About ten minutes later, I hunkered down in the chair, and I looked in the rearview mirror, and there he was, right behind us, up through 60, 80, 100, 120 miles an hour. He was right, right, right with us. Dakota said, Clifford said, I want that car. We pulled over on the apron, and as we dismounted, he bore down on us. I don't know how the hell fast he was going. <laughs> we roared by, down about a quarter of a mile, turned back, flew back at us, <laughs> back and forth 20 times. <laughs> that guy flew, and Dakota said, Clifford out there waving oil, bonds, and stock futures, and jewels, and <laughs> drugs. Say, stop, I want to buy your damn car. Finally, the guy began to slow down, stopped right in front of us, 
big cloud of dust. The cold said Clifford waved in, waded into that, kicking cinders and gravel. There was that old man standing there. But there was no car. What happened to that 1934 Plymouth Roadster, Dakota said Clifford said. The fellow said, I wasn't in it. He took off out of that station so damn fast, the guy with suspenders caught in your rear bumper. 